It's a pleasure to be with you again today. We are continuing in our study of the book of Nehemiah, a very interesting historical book that also has a lot of practical lessons for us to apply today. So today we'll be studying Nehemiah chapter 5. Now, what we've seen in the first couple chapters is that Nehemiah heard the problem. The problem was that Jerusalem was in a state of disrepair. So he prayed, he prepared, and he planned, and God gave him the opportunity to go back to Jerusalem, and so they started work on rebuilding the wall. But that's not the end of the story. They faced a lot of opposition from others who did not want to see them succeed. And in this chapter, we'll see that they're also going to face adversity and opposition even from within. So when we try to build God's kingdom and work for God, we're going to face obstacles. Sometimes those obstacles are outside of us from outside in the world. And sometimes those obstacles are from within us or even from within the church. So let us read Nehemiah chapter 5. I'll read this chapter in sections and we will discuss each section. So the first section is verses 1 through 5. And that is the problem uh, that is going to bring about some issues for the people as they try to rebuild the wall. Now there arose a a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many. So let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, We borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers. Our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved. But it is not in our power to help it. For other men have our fields and our vineyards. And we'll see that Nehemiah was very angry to hear this report. So in chapter 4, we saw everything was going very well. The people were working together as one to rebuild the wall. And it's oftentimes when things are going very well that strife and discord and division are going to come in because Satan wants to stop the work that God's people are doing. So this problem here is that the people didn't the the richer people were exploiting the poor. And disunity is one of the quickest ways to stop people from working together toward a common goal. We've seen the adversity from external forces and now we see adversity from within the ranks. How much better for Satan if he can get God's people to turn against each other. Now, many of the poor families here are complaining against the rich. They were struggling just to survive. Now, instead of their richer brethren helping them as they should have done, treated them as family, the richer Jews were actually taking advantage of them. The poor Jews needed to eat. So the richer ones offered to help them, but at a price. And the price was a heavy one. So you see that many of them were forced to mortgage their fields and their vineyards. They had to basically get help, uh, perhaps uh, to get seed from the rich, from those who were more rich. They wanted to get help, get supplies so they could plant their fields. But to do so, they didn't have any money. And so they were had to pay these great uh, amounts to get these things. And they had to even mortgage their fields in order to pay the cost, even to get money to eat. Now, that in itself wasn't the worst of it. They didn't only have to use their fields and their property as collateral. Uh, We do see they borrowed money, so they're getting into debt. But in verse 5, it says even their children were being forced to be slaves. So when property wasn't enough collateral, they took their Jewish brother's children as slaves. Can you imagine that? Basically, they were supposed to be treating each other as family members. If your family member says, I need some help because I don't have enough money to eat. And you say, all right, I'll help you. I'll give you some money, but you have to give me your child as a slave. That is the kind of thing that was going on there. These greedy people were seeing an opportunity to exploit others. And what could they do? These people, they they want the poorer ones. They wanted to eat. They wanted to live. They wanted to survive. And so for them, it felt like they had no choice but to pay what was being asked, whether that meant mortgaging their fields or giving out their children as slaves. 
There was also a heavy, uh, heavy interest being charged to the poor class. And so they felt, they really felt no way to get out from under this yoke of debt. They had uh, king's tax to pay as well. And so they, they had to pay the, the government and they also had to pay the Jewish lenders. And they felt that there was no way out. It was a classic case of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. So what should the richer class have done? Well, first of all, what they were doing was disobedient to what God had commanded them to do. Uh, we see in Deuteronomy 23, 19, it says, You shall not charge interest on loans to your brother, interest on money, interest on food, interest on anything that is lent for interest. So they were not to charge interest to their fellow Jews. When their fellow Jews were in need, they were supposed to lend the money and let them pay back the same amount of money which they had borrowed. So in this passage, we learn about the importance of having the correct view of money. And even considering the question, why does God give us money or any resources? What are we to do with the money that we have? Now, these rich people were approaching this in a very selfish way. They thought, this is my money. I'm going to use it to make even more money for me. But we should not think of our money as like this. But instead, we should be stewards. Whatever money God has given to you, given to me, let us realize this. he's given this to us to be a steward of it so that we should use it for building his kingdom. We should use it to share generously with others who need it when we are able to do so. We should not foolishly throw money away, but neither should we be stingy and selfish and hold on to it and use it for ourselves. We see in Proverbs 3.27, it says, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is, when it is in your power to do it. When you can help others, do it. Maybe that's even why God gave you that resources so that you could share it with the one who is in need. And also Proverbs 19, 17, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his deed. God gives us resources so that we can be generous with others. Perhaps that's even why God made these Jews wealthy was so that they could help their poorer countrymen when they needed it, but instead they were exploiting them. So let's consider how we are using money ourselves and if we are being generous or not. Let's move forward. Uh, verse 6 to 11, this is uh, the part where Noah, uh, sorry, <laughs> Nehemiah hears about this and rebukes the people. I was very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. I took counsel with myself and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, you are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we, as far as we are able, have brought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations. But you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. So how did Nehemiah feel about this? Well, he was very angry. We're going to learn from this several lessons from Nehemiah about being a good leader. Actually, in this book, we learn a lot of lessons from him about what a good leader will do. And what we see here is a case of righteous anger. Nehemiah was the leader of his people. He was trying to inspire them to work together on this important but very difficult task. They were facing adversity from their enemies. And now he heard this news about Jews exploiting other Jews. He wasn't happy. So notice that a good leader cannot and does not ignore sin. A good leader is not passive. He doesn't just sit on the sidelines, but he cares spiritually and emotionally for his people he shows empathy and concern for those he cares for. And so when Nehemiah heard this, 
he was very upset. That shows the level of concern he had for others. This also gives us a reminder that sometimes it is right to be angry. Oftentimes, the, the opposite of righteous anger is apathy. People who don't care, they see injustices going on in the world around them and they don't care because it's not them and they have their own busy life to get to. Nehemiah does care. Good leaders do. Good leader also takes action. Nehemiah's strong emotional response forced him to take action to solve the issue. And that's actually why God put in us this uh, righteous anger barometer so that when we feel this righteous anger, it will motivate us to do something about it. Good leaders don't just stand by and let sin and disunity rip apart God's people. Instead, he must take action to deal with the sin. Nehemiah also is not afraid to stand up publicly against the sin. A good leader is not afraid to speak the truth. Nehemiah publicly and directly speaks out against the culprits. He says, I took counsel with myself. So he thought about it for a while and then he brought charges against the nobles and the officials. And he said these things to them. He then spoke in public to all of these people about what they had been doing. And he puts the blame squarely on the backs of the richer class. They were the ones who were disobeying God's command. We just saw not to loan out money and interest to others. He doesn't mince words. He doesn't candy coat it. He brings the problem out. And then he makes it clear who is responsible and exactly what the wrong they have done is. But he doesn't just rebuke them and then leave it there and let them stay in this uh, twilight zone of regret. But rather, he wants to bring them back. He wants to restore them. And in fact, good rebukes are supposed to bring about correction and restoration, not just leave the people feeling sorry for their sin, but leaving them a way to come back and be restored to the right path. And so we see in verse 8, he says, look, for us, we, meaning Nehemiah and some of the other political leaders with him apparently have bought back our Jewish brothers who've been sold to the nation. So some of the Jews had been sold as slaves to other nations and Nehemiah spent his own money to purchase them and set them free in Jerusalem. But they even sold their brothers. But again, he is going to offer them a path of restoration. He says, what you're doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God and to prevent the taunts of the nations of our enemies? And so he tells them in verse 11, return to them their fields, vineyards, orchards, houses, the percentage of the money, the grain, the wine, and the oil that you have been exacting from them. So some of the Jews had apparently banded together to try to repurchase as many Jewish slaves from the Gentiles as they could. Great. This was an excellent and honorable plan. But then there's these others who are regressing and becoming like the nations around them by valuing wealth, luxury over their brethren. Nehemiah knew that they could do better. So he was optimistic. He believed better about them. He believed they could and would do better in the future. So he doesn't adopt a pessimistic or negative attitude about the people. He did not assume the worst, but he believed the best. And then he challenged them to do that. He says, fix it. Fix it. Go return to them what you have taken. You can still fix this if you're willing to. Many years ago, I was a teacher for young kids in a training center. And I and the assistant teacher who, who were with me, we kept asking one father to encourage his kid to take part in the activities. The child was very intelligent, very capable, very able to do it. But the father kept saying, he can't do it. He's too little. He doesn't know how. So he didn't believe in his kid. He didn't encourage him to reach his full potential. But rather, he was pessimistic. And actually, that became somewhat of a self-fulfilling prophecy because he didn't believe in and help his boy accomplish the tasks. Then his son really didn't improve uh, or learn like the other boys did in a class. So it's very important for parents or for teachers, bosses, leaders in the church, leaders at every level of society to encourage and to challenge those who are following you to do better, 
Not to say, okay, you are, you know, you're not intelligent and you're not capable and you're always going to be like that way. That's just harsh and mean criticism that doesn't accomplish anything. It doesn't inspire anyone to do better. But we tell people, yes, what you've done is wrong. That's not good. But you can do better. I believe that you can do better the next time. And so that's the kind of mentality that we want to adopt toward the people around us is a positive one to encourage them, inspire them, push them forward in their walk with the Lord. We also see from this that a good leader wants his people to be a good testimony. Now, Nehemiah realized that their actions would be scrutinized by others. By treating each other poorly, the unbelievers around them would have reason to criticize and to slander them. Why would anyone want to believe in God if the Jews they saw were arguing and exploiting each other? That would not attract people to God, but would repel them. Jesus told the disciples that it is our love which would attract people to him. John 13, 34 and 35 says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So how will people know you're my disciples? Not by charging each other interest, not by exploiting, not by, you know, taking advantage of one another, but by loving one another. That is how they will know. And what a terrible testimony this was to the other nations. What a terrible testimony it is when in the church we divide and we argue and we discourage rather than coming alongside and generously helping our brothers and sisters in Christ when they have need. Our actions, our attitudes should never repel people from God. Now, a good leader challenges his people to repent. Again, verse 11, return to them this very day. Return, change your direction. The word for repent in the Old Testament means to change direction, specifically to change direction and then follow the Lord. So Nehemiah rebuked them, but he didn't leave them with a rebuke at the end. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.16 tells us the purpose of Scripture. Sorry, 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So reproof and then correction. So it's not just reproof and leave them there, but it's correct and bring them back again. Now there's a great difference between a father who is angry at his child for hitting someone and says, what's the matter with you? You're a wicked and a rude boy. Then the father who says, you should not hit. Go and ask forgiveness. Next time, share your toys instead of hitting someone who tries to take them from you. Very, very different. Now, how do you feel when you are scolded? If you're like most people, you don't feel very good about it. But our ultimate goal is not to let people feel badly. Now, that might be necessary as a stepping stone to repentance. But again, the final goal is restoration. And this is what Nehemiah does. He asked the people to stop charging interest and to immediately return everything to those poor people. He knew words were not enough. It's not enough to say, oh, this is bad. He needs to tell them what to do moving forward. Uh, parents and teachers, we can learn a lot from his example as well. So in this passage, we've seen the problem was exploiting the poor people and Nehemiah's solution was stop doing it and return to them what you have taken. It reminds us how to be a good leader, and it also reminds us how to use our money to bless others rather than in, an, in a selfish way. So let's go forward to the next part, the people's response, verses 12 to 13. Then they said, we will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord, and the people did as they had promised. 
So here we learn what repentance is. Repentance requires a changed heart and changed direction. The people agreed to Nehemiah's proposal. They publicly promised to follow through and to do exactly what Nehemiah said. Wow, what a good example. Wouldn't it be great if we were humble and teachable like this? Notice they didn't argue. They didn't say, you don't understand the facts. Or they didn't say, okay, we were poor once and now it's our turn. You don't understand what it's like. You don't understand how we need security. Or you don't really understand the situation. They didn't argue. They didn't defend themselves. They didn't make excuses. They didn't blame others. They just said, you're right. We shouldn't be doing that. And then they said, we promise that we will change. We're not going to treat them the same way as we did before. Wouldn't it be great if we repented like that? Our natural tendency is that when someone corrects us, we tend to argue and we tend to defend ourselves, to justify ourselves. Repentance means we need to be teachable and humble in order to listen. It also, though, requires follow through. And so Nehemiah knew that they needed to follow through. They promised that they were going to do it. And so Nehemiah uh, strikes while the kettle is hot. He's like, okay, they're in a mood to repent. Let's take this all the way and to make sure they follow through. So he called the priest together and he says, swear in the presence of the priests. And in that culture at that time, swearing was a very, very serious thing. You were not to swear anything rashly unless you really, really uh, had thought about it and meant what you said and intended to follow through. So, you know, Nehemiah is like, okay, you've made a deal. Now sign your name. Put your signature to the paper to show that you really mean it. And so he had them all make an oath. And he knew it's very easy to backslide. It's very easy when everybody's together and the authority is telling you what you should do in a moment of either guilt or maybe emotional reaction to say, yeah, 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 I'll do it. And then later when you go back home, you start counting the money again and thinking how much it's going to cost. And he knew that a lot of people might be tempted to go back on their promise. So he wanted to make sure that they followed through with what they said. And then he gave a warning. He says, look, if you don't do it, then may God shake you out uh, from your house and from your labor. May you be shaken out and emptied. In other words, when you make a promise to God, that's a serious thing. You'd better not go back on it or you'll have to face the consequences of that sin and unfaithfulness. So Nehemiah, uh, wow, he's such a strong leader, a good leader to encourage the people to do what is right. And he motivated them and he solved this problem. And then the people uh, changed, their, changed their ways and decided to be generous to their uh, brothers and sisters again. Let's go forward to the last part of this chapter, verses 14 through 19. This is about Nehemiah's generosity. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them for their daily ration 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people. But I did not do so. Because of the fear of God, I also persevered in the work on this wall. And we acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now, what was, my, what was prepared at my expense? For each day was one ox and six choice sheep and birds, and every ten days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this I did not demand the food allowance of the governor, because the service was too heavy on this people." Remember for my good, O oh my God, all that I have done for this people. Okay, so from this passage, we see that Nehemiah was appointed to be governor. Uh, this was his position for much of the time of the book of Nehemiah. Uh, most likely, this part is inserted a little bit 
later. In other words, it doesn't likely come chronologically in the story, but it comes thematically into the story at this point in time. When Nehemiah came the first time, he was likely not yet governor. He would go back to uh, to Persia as he told the king, and then the king likely made him governor, and then he would come back to the land again. Uh, but this part is inserted thematically here because Nehemiah is telling that the people were abusing the poor and exploiting them. And here he's showing this is what you should do. Here's a good model for you to follow. Rather than exploiting others, you should generously share with others. And so he gives them an example of a good model to follow. Now what we see here is that Nehemiah feared God. Because he feared God, he sacrificed his personal rights. Now the other governors they received the governor's allowance from the people because that's what they should get as being the governor, right? That was their position. That was what they were entitled to do. But Nehemiah didn't do that. He did not receive the food allowance of the governor. That is, he did not take the food from the people that he was ruling over. It was normal. It was customary, but Nehemiah didn't do it. So he sacrificed his wealth, his materials, his possessions, what was rightfully his according to the Persian law, he sacrificed it for the sake of the people because he realized they were, they were, many of them were poor and he didn't want to take those things from them because their, their position, their status was low. He also sacrificed his time and his energy, obviously working on the wall together with his servants. And he does all of these things because he doesn't want to be a burden to the people. He even sacrificed his own money. It says even their servants, that is the previous, the previous governors, even their servants lorded it over the people. The previous governor's servants acted like they were the governor, they were the boss, and they went around and mistreated others. But Nehemiah didn't do so. So here we see his motivation for all of these things he's doing. He says, because of the fear of of God because I fear God. So instead of demanding the governor's food allowance, he actually served 150 Jews and officials at his table every day. And this was all done at his own expense, at his own expense. So he paid for 150 others to eat food at his table every day. All of the oxen, all of the sheep, all of the birds, all of the wine, which he's talking about in the next few chapter, uh, next few verses, were all at his own cost, his own expense. So he wasn't looking after his own interests, but he was looking after the interests of others. And again, it was because he feared God. So what is your motivation? What is my motivation? Are we motivated out of a desire for more money, more wealth, more materials, more security, more prosperity? Or are we, are we motivated out of a desire to truly help others and bless others? We really have a lot to learn from Nehemiah. Now, when you look at the end, he says, he, he prays and he asks God, he says, God, please remember me for the good that I have done for all this people. Nehemiah asked God to remember him. So Nehemiah was not pursuing earthly rewards or treasures. He wasn't trying to get these things from the people around him. He instead wanted God to see and God to know what he had done. And he was seeking a heavenly re reward rather than an earthly one. That's the same thing which we learn we should do in Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. He was doing it for God. And, he's, and it says, knowing that from the Lord, you receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. You will receive your reward from God. Nehemiah knew that. He, he acknowledged that. And he told God, I want to receive the reward from you, not from anything in this world. So whatever we do, let us make sure that we are trying to please God and not please men. So from this chapter, we learn how important it is to be a good steward of what God has given to us. I encourage you as we finish this lesson to think some about the things God has blessed you with, whether it's your money, 
or your possessions like your house or your car, whatever he's put into your hands, how can you use those things to bless others and to build the kingdom? And how can you respond when people around you need help? Perhaps a student needs help with expenses or perhaps someone has been sick and has extra medical bills. What can you do to help these people how to be a good steward? And also, I think we can learn a lesson from Nehemiah about what it means to be a good leader, that we really, really care for the people under us, that we are empathetic, that we care for them to the extent that when we see injustice being done to them, that it moves us to righteous anger and that that righteous anger even motivates us to do something about it, to be men and women of action, to work at solving these problems and and building God's kingdom here on earth. So I hope that this lesson was encouraging for you, learning how to be a steward and how to be a good leader. And I would invite you to join us next time as we study Nehemiah chapter 6. God bless and hope to see you then.